on the Level Talk Show. You're tuned to On A Level with Ancobia. This is Muta Baruka. Ayuri. Get ready for some of the hottest talk on radio. The On A Level Talk Show addresses issues that matter to you. Ancobia with On A Level. <laughs> Welcome to a visual on a level talk show with myself, the host, and Cobia. Um, those of you, some of you may be familiar with my YouTube channel already. And for some of you, this may be the first time you're seeing the on a level talk show. Again, say welcome to you wherever you are. We are at the famous Express Truth Studios. So we want to say a big, big thank you to Express Truth for allowing us to come to their studio and um, to do our visual show from here. Now, if you've been following the channel, um, and even if you've been following me on radio, you may know that recently I've been doing a series called The Resurrection of Marcus Bosaya Gavi. Now, this was originally a radio production that I put together with 31 men from the community. In fact, 52 men came forward, but we then chose 31 men. Um, and we put it out on radio and one of the reasons that I did the project was because I wanted black men, older black men, younger black men, middle-aged black men to come together and work together and to show the community that black men can work together. There's often a perception that our brothers don't work together and I wanted to somehow try and counteract that. Black History Month is also coming up and you know Black History Month normally is like a, a countdown maybe 10 famous things that a person did or whatever, you know? And I said, no, I want something different this Black History Month. I want us to focus on one person solidly for 31 days. Um, Black History Month in the UK is in an October. So we started the project from around July, August. And then what I did was put the call out. And like I said, people came forward and As I said, I wanted the brothers to come together and show that they could work together and for them to take in one personality. What greater personality, I thought, for black men to work with than Marcus Messiah Garvey, who I saw as a sort of a grandfather figure for most of our brothers. You know, it's so hot in this studio. I feel like I'm in Jamaica. I feel like I'm, yeah, I feel like, actually, I feel like when I was in Kenya and I was on the equator and I thought, no, they're going to have to, bring some shovels and just bury me here. It was so hot. I was right on the equator. I'll never forget that. That was, this heat is just like that, but it's good. It's good because we're in England and England's normally freezing, freezing. So we have to give thanks when the sun comes. So I'm giving thanks, but I'm just letting you know that I'm hot. In case you're wondering why is she fanning herself like every second, even though I've got a big fan in front of me, I'm still fanning myself. Okay. So like I said, we, brought the brothers together and for us, Gavi is like a, like a grandfather f- type figure. And that's how I saw these men would look up to Gavi as a sort of a great grandfather, actually a great grandfather who passes wisdom down. And oftentimes what I find, I come from a quote unquote Gavi, quote unquote Pan-Africanist background. And oftentimes I find people say they know about various peers persons, but when you probe them, they really don't. They just know blurt bits and blurbs about the person and their history. They don't really know the full the philosophy that guided them, the mission that they were really on or what they were really trying to do. Um, so the brothers engaged with the speeches. You've now got access to 15 of the speeches so far. 15 of the speeches so far. And the last one we've just put up, is the speech that we're now going to discuss and dissect. People wanted me to put the speeches up all at once. And I said, no, I don't want to put them all up at one time. Because I didn't believe that people would engage with them fully if I just put 31 speeches up at once. I said, no, I'm going to space them. Also as well, why I did the project on radio as well, I was just saying to our guest, who I'm going to introduce you to shortly, I was just saying to him that, Oftentimes, black radio focuses on mainly music, like morning to evening, 24-7, it's just music. 
But radio was originally speech. That was really the medium for radio speech. And I think we've lost the art of speech. We have the odd talk show here and there. But when I say speech, I mean speech production. Black radio stations do not, as far as I know, in the UK. And my experience in Africa, my experience in Jamaica, my experience in Barbados, I've not seen any speech production. Speech production is a big part of radio. It's millions upon millions of pounds are made from speech production. When you go to Waterstones or Borders or, or, or WH Smith, look at what the BBC is selling. They sell speech radio. They don't sell their music shows. They sell the arches. They sell all sorts of stuff, but it's all talk-based. And somehow I think we've lost that. Well, not even we've lost the balance. We've never had that balance where radio was concerned. It's because we've used it primarily music and the odd debate show here and there. But I think we need to step up again. And I've been calling for this for years to happen um, on radio in the UK and when I've traveled to say we've got to get serious about audio production. Yeah. When this went out on the radio, it had a massive impact. This show, people were stopping me everywhere and commenting on the show calling me, begging me for copies of what they were hearing because they'd never heard the speeches of Marcus Garvey. They never knew Garvey did so many speeches. They'd only heard about two speeches of Garvey. One, there's two on the internet. One is about 17 minutes, 25 seconds long. The other one is about three minutes. Some people extend it to about eight minutes. Um, but generally, it's about three minutes. So by doing it this way, for the first time, people were hearing of Papa Garvey, Marcus Mosiah Garvey, in his own words, unfiltered. No one could interpret for you what he was saying. You, could, you the audience, got to interpret what those speeches meant for you. Today we're doing a very, very special show with a very, very special guest. Someone very dear to my heart, a very dear friend of mine. His name is Brother Aimani. Welcome to the On A Level Talk show. Thank you very much, um, Sister Uncle. So lovely to have you here. It's a pleasure. Now, Brother Aimani, he did the speech that's just gone up, and that speech is called Look for Me in a Whirlwind or a Storm. That was done around 1924, Aimani? Around that time. Yeah, there was no particular month was given, but it was around that time. That's the speech that's also on the internet, on YouTube. So Aimani had a hard job because all the other speeches, there's no Gavi speech to go by. So nobody could say... Ah, now, nah, Gavi didn't say it like this, and Gavi didn't say it like that. Unfortunately, Imani has that challenge ahead of him now. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll be looking out for some of the comments that come uh, to us. But he did a great job, an excellent job of doing that speech. Now, Imani is one of the foremost Gaviite scholars in the UK. Can I say that, Armani? I would say that. Yeah, I, would, I, would I would say, say that. that. I would say that. And you're going to see why, folks. When we get into the discussion, you're going to see, say why. And I say that because Armani does all the workshops. Armani is the one who does all the exhibitions. Armani goes up and down teaching Gavi. So that's why I say one of the foremost scholars in the UK on Marcus Gavi. He's just being humble. That's all it is, folks. He's being very, very humble. Um, can you see my... Picture we got here of Marcus Messiah Gavi. I, I hope I'm going to show it to you at the end of the show. The mural is, I just feel it's such good company. I got a Gaviite on my left, our brother Mark, a Gaviite in front of me, Amani, and the penultimate, the man himself, Marcus Messiah Gavi, on my right. So who's behind me? The ancestors. Ah, <laughs> okay, so Amani. Yes. You did project with us, Resurrection, the Resurrection of Marcus Messiah Garvey. Um, you approached me and you said you thought it would be a good idea if we could have a discussion about the speech. I think I was speaking to you about the, I didn't feel like there was a lot of engagement with some of the speeches that we'd put up from the public and I was kind of querying why. And then we had a long discussion, if you remember, as to some of the beliefs that have gone out about Garvey within our community and why this has somehow stopped people from approaching Garvey because of who they perceive him to be. Mm -hmm. 
Before we go there, though, please tell us, our audience, about who Armani is, where Armani comes from, your background, and how you came to be a Gaviite, yes, a so devout so. Gaviite. Certainly. Um, but first, let me just mention um, the project, because I was obviously as a part of the project. And we did, um, at the end of the project as well, um, um, quite a few of us, the, the, the men who read the speeches, we sat down, we had a discussion as well. Um, and we, you know, we spoke about the different speeches that we've done. But it was a, it was a fabulous project. And you know, even the speeches that, I mean, I read one speech, but there's a lot of speeches um, that was, that was um, recited and narrated that I had never heard myself until I heard those speeches. Um, so that's a fabulous project, and everybody should um, make it their um, point to go and listen to all of those speeches. Because these speeches are not um, well known, they're not publicized, and you know, even to find them, um, Sister Anne Colby had to do a lot of work, a um, lot of research, a lot of study. I was uh, I was around at the time, <laughs> sleepless nights, and you know, and as you can imagine, there's thousands, hundreds of speeches of Marcus Garvey, so she had to select 31 um, speeches. And obviously, I, I I can't say I've listened to all of them, but I listened to most of them. And you know, it's a fabulous project and some excellent um, resources, um, and they're there for our posterity. So I'd just like to say that the project itself, um, 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 well done, and, and, and Corby. And Thank you. Much respect and much honor for that project. And for me personally, and I'll go on and I'll explain why for me, that's probably one of the most important projects that I've ever been, in, been a part of. But for me, one of the most important projects that's been done in recent times that can give us something to work with in the time that we are at now. And because there's a lot of things being um, and put out there, knowledge-based, different ideas and so forth about our current situation and what we need to be doing. But it was good to hear from Marcus Garvey's perspective nearly 100 years ago. And he already, and if you listen to the speeches, go back and listen to the speeches. It's, it's nearly 100 years ago, but you will find out that Every single speech, most of the things that Garvey says, it still, um, it still have um, significance um, to us today and it's still relevant to us today, even more so today because of the situation that we are in, which he was warning us about <laughs> um, in those speeches. So it's a very good um, project and a very um, good tool and resource to bring us up to the modern times in regards to how we should be perceiving our current um, circumstances. I'm not saying that we mustn't and look and listen to those people today who are obviously giving us their opinions and their ideas about what we need to be doing and where we are. But when it comes from somebody like Marcus Garvey and when we're listening to things coming from somebody like Marcus Garvey, it gives us a lot more authority, a lot more credentials because he has actually done things um, to prove that he knows what he was talking about. So uh, Marcus Garvey's words are a bit different from most people in regards to we know that and what he's saying out of his mouth has great significance in the sense that we know that he knows that what he's talking about is because he moved so many black people and he's done so many um, great things to uplift black people. So um, these speeches are very important um, for us in this, in, in this day and age. So I'd just like to say that before I even start. And the reason why it's so important, the reason why that project in particular is so important to me, because my whole journey started with just one speech, just one simple speech. And you'll see if we show the mural later on, it's the it's a speech that is normally found underneath that particular image. One of the most popular images of Marcus Garvey that we know. Um, it was it was in um, circulation in the 70s and 80s, early 90s. One of the most popular um, posters, and it's, you know, be be as proud of your race as your as your, um, peer, as your forefathers were in the days of old. We shall create another. And so that speech itself is what actually influenced me. Um, now, what, how that came about? Very, it's very interesting because you won't be you won't be able to understand who Imani is unless you understand how I come to know Marcus Garvey. Mm -hmm. and the Tell role. us who Imani is. Yeah. So that's so. So what happened was, um, I was twelve years of age, um, and I went with my um, with my stepfather to a, a Rastaman's house. Um, he was talking to the Rastaman inside the kitchen, and I was standing up, um. Behind a city, behind a city, a three-piece um, city, and I stand up behind it, and I'm trying to read a Marcus Garvey's poster on the wall, um, and I'm reading it from a distance, and I'm you know, squinting my eyes, and the man's walked out of the, um, the kitchen and said, "What do you do? Say you a man that 
He said, go read it. Are you a man that? That's exactly <laughs> what he said to me. Because Marcus Garvey, in that picture, obviously he's got his, he's like an admiral kind of um, regalia on. Yeah. And his feather and all the rest. So I, I, first of all, I'm thinking, who is that? I'd never seen a black person dressed like that before. So my first thought was, who's that? Yeah. Then I try and, trying to read and work it out. So when I've gone there and I've read it, as I've said, for people who, um, who, who know the speech, be as part of our race as our fathers were in the days of old, we have a beautiful history, we shall create another in the future that shall establish the world. When I read that, bearing in mind, this is in the early 80s, um, I had just, not so long, probably about a year before that, wrote, um, watched Roots. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, we, I went to school in Britain, so I knew nothing about um, black history. The only thing I knew about black history at that time was roots. So this particular speech, to a certain degree, stumbled me. What history is he talking about? Mm. We have a beautiful history. What history? And we're going to create another in the future that shall establish the world. Now, what that did for me is think, well, my first thought was, well, if I don't know what that history is, and I don't know what you're talking about, what, uh, what can we, what could I recreate, or how can we recreate something that doesn't exist? Mm-hmm. That's when I was 13 years of age. 13 years of age, I'm still young, I'm still experiencing. So from 13 years of age till I'm about 19 years of age, the most I'm going to say is that I didn't go in a, say, positive or productive way. Mm -hmm. And for people who are watching this who know me, and a lot of people know me as Lickshot, that was my name. Lickshot, you know. Lickshot was my name. How did you get a name like that? Was you busting shots? Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm (laughs) fully on the road. I'm fully, 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 fully on the road. Mm. And a little bit behind my story, just, just to give you an indication of what type of young person I was. And by the age of, like the first time I was arrested and put in, in, in a cell, I was nine years of age. That's the first time. At the age of nine, and you got arrested. Nine, okay. I was arrested and put in a cell. And I was arrested up until I was nine, 19 years of age, 19 years of age, 10 different times. I got arrested when I was 12, 13, 15, 16, for all different manners wow. of crime. Um, um, all different manners of crime, but everything that you can think of, um, I've been arrested for, but because I was with a crew and so forth, I never had to serve no time, but a lot of my friends around me served serious time. Mm-hmm. But I didn't have Were to they older me. than you or no, younger? a bit older than me. And this is older. why I was kind of safeguarded, um, because I was kind of like the youngest one in our kind of crew, so everybody had to kind of like protect me, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and a lot of them was my family as well, Yeah. Um, so obviously... I, I was shielded from certain certain things. Mm. Um, but that was the life I was going. I was excluded from school, no qualifications whatsoever. I had my first child when I was still in school. So that's the way I'm going. How I old am, was you when you had your first child? I just turned 16. I'm still in the um, last year of school. Original bad boy. Yeah, so I, I learned about my child in my school uniform. I learned about my child in school. Yeah. Um, so that's the way I'm going. So that's the, yeah. that's the life I'm living. I'm fully, fully engaged mm. in, in, in life. And now I can explain it. At the time, um, that is what I saw as a, as a black man. Mm. Um, you know, the kind of environment I came up with, it was very hard. I, 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 I'm not, I, it's very hard for me to conform um, because of the environment that I came up in. I never, actually, I never came up with a family that went to church and things like that. I never had to go to no church. I never had to read no Bible. I grew up amongst gamblers, you know, violence. <laughs> That's what I grew up amongst. Mm. Um, so oh boy. I, yes, I, I didn't need to conform. When I go to school, I can do what I want. Mm. You know? And um, so I didn't need to conform and I didn't need to follow anybody. So when I was younger, I was very hard to contain. Very, very hard to contain. So let's just clarify this. Your idea of being a black man was yeah. being a gangster. This is what I'm going to explain. So to me, mm. I definitely didn't want to be anything remote like white or coconut. It's mm. not my experience. So I wanted to be the real black man. Mm-hmm. So to be the real black man, according to what I was perceiving at that time, I had to be a bad man. I had to have many girls. Mm. I had to drive big car. I was buying cars and before I could drive. Mm. I used to buy cars and make my bedrooms drive it. Mm. I used to wear gold, chaparitas, rings, all the rest of it. That's what I thought mm. that a black man was. And anybody who knows Lickshot knows that Lickshot was on road hard. Mm. And I was doing very, very well. Very, very well. Mm. My artist as well. So I was able to travel around the Midlands, um, all over the place and chat lyrics. So Singer or DJ? DJ. DJ. Oh, oh. At that time, DJs were the most popular. And that's when in our most popular time, because we wasn't being played on radio. You couldn't see us on TV. So it was so in our community, system. sound system, DJs was the, was the man. Mm. So when I, I was a good DJ as well, as I, and I was one of the youngest on the circuit as well. So I used to travel all over the place. And obviously that would help me to, to establish 
reputation that I had. And 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 do your trade. And do my trade. Okay. I was involved in a lot of of bad things up until about the age of nineteen. And I'll just tell it straight. I can say it because many years ago. Yeah. Um, this is when um you know early nineties. This is when crack, crack cocaine come on the streets, which mm-hmm. changed their whole. Changed the whole yeah, dynamics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Changed everything. Changed everything. Out road. I was out there when it, when, it, when it took place. So what actually happened was, I got myself, I'm involved in that because I'm on road. That's where the money was. So I'm involved in it. I'm in it. I'm, I'm out there. I'm smoking it. So everything myself. And I see myself going down a road. At that time, I got about three or four people doing like big mm-hmm. sentences, nine years, 12 years life mm-hmm. around me. So I know my time's coming. You understand? Mm-hmm. Well, that's the life we're living. So it's, it's, that's just straight. So I'm living. And I'm going through, and then what happened was, I know that things are not right. I know that things are not going to go right. Uh, so, but there's no way out. Mm-hmm. There's no way out for me. As I say, I got no Christian background to fall back on. I got no education at this time. Mm-hmm. You understand? So I got nothing to fall back on. So I went to my friend's house. And my friend had the same poster mm-hmm. on the wall. I'm about 19. Put your mic over for me just a little bit, please. Yeah. yeah. I was about 19 years of age. Police. Just pull it. To the, yeah. Okay. The producer. You got to have the in-house producer. And it's really important Thank that you, people Thank really you. understand mm-hmm. um, how I come to know and how I come Thank to, 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 to become um, associated and, you know, with Marcus Garvey and his, his words and so forth. It's when I was 19 years of age, I went to one of my virgin's house. He had children, so he had come off the road a bit. He was settling down. And he had Marcus Garvey's picture, the same picture that I saw when I was 13 years of age on his it, wall. In, in, in the Rassi's house. Oh, in, in the same in the same yard. In the, in this, this is when I'm 19 now. Yeah. This is like six years later. And Lickshot mm. is on road hard, mm. hard, very hard. So I go into my Bridging's house, go to check him to do something. And he, he's got that Marcus Garvey picture on the wall. Mm. And as soon as I saw that Marcus Garvey picture, he just brought me back to when I was 13. Just brought me back to when I was 13 years of age. And I remember the man saying, are you a man that? That's yeah. how the man said it to me. He said, are you a man that? You understand? Mm. What did you take that to mean? It's my man. Yeah. Just simple as that. Yeah. You understand? It's my man. That's my man. That man's for me. Yeah. I thought, at the time, I think it's for all black people. Yeah, yeah, all, yeah, yeah. You yeah, know, it's yeah, a black yeah. people. That's what he's saying. But when he said it to me, that's your man. Mm-hmm. Are you a man that? You understand? That's a personal thing. You understand? Even though in my mind, I'm thinking it's everybody, but he's talking to me. It's mm-hmm. my man. So when I saw the picture at my Bridgen's house, I said to my Bridgen, I said, Bridgen, I said, if you love your Bridgen, lick shot, you'll give me that poster. My Bridgen said, nah, lick shot, man. Just get it myself, you know what I mean? And he loved that poster. I just got it. Somebody give it to him. I said, bless. I said, if you love your Bridgen, lick shot, you'll give me that poster. And my Bridgen took the poster off the wall and he gave it to me. Mm. And I brought it into my flat. I lived across the hall and I pulled it like, where I would, like, as I walked from my front door, as I walked in my front door, I put it right on the wall there. Mm. And I recited that every day. And that is how I got reassociated with Marcus Garvey. You understand? That what do you mean reassociated? Because you weren't from just... 6, 13 to 6 oh, to 19, okay. Marcus uh. Garvey was not in my brain. Okay, so from the first time you saw the image to the second time, the second time I there's saw a, re- a reconnection. A reconnection. Mm-hmm. So at the time, that speech again, became my endeavor. What history is this man talking about? Yeah, yeah. What can I do? Especially after seeing Roots. Yeah. That impact that it had on us. Mm-hmm. That was that was devastating. Massive, massive. Fights broke out all mm-hmm. over the country in yeah, school. 100%. The next day I was in fights with my best friend. Oh, it was terrible. It had such a, it was just devastating. Mm-hmm. It was devastating 100%. because as you're saying, there was nothing to counterbalance it with. I never mm-hmm. saying to my mum, so what? It's that all we ever was was slaves, mum. Mm-hmm. They just come on the planet as slaves. I, I just went mad. I was so angry. Mm-hmm. I was so angry because I was like, there must be something else. Mm-hmm. It was like, no, we were just we were just slaves. Well, and I, I couldn't I couldn't accept it, but I had nothing to counteract that idea mm-hmm. that some of the adults had around me until my yeah, dad began to talk to me about Marcus Garvey. But you were saying. Yeah, so the roots is a, the roots had a major impact when I was younger. But let me just explain this. Mm. When I was older, there is another film. There are two more films that come out that also are having a traumatic, dramatic effect on the psychology of, of young people, particularly me. You understand? And I think this is as mo- this is as important, or if not the main factor, why I turned to Marcus Garvey at that mm. time. 
And I'm talking about New Jack City and Boys in the Hood. Mm. You understand? When we was on road, we also got um, certain tapes such come to us. Gangster mm. rap. It wasn't there when we started. That started to influence us. And I'm on road, so I'm going with it. So when I'm looking to get out of road, it's, it's desperation. But I also know what's coming. Mm. I know the day that we're in now. I saw it. I, I started it. I was mm. part of it. Mm. You understand? It started as a revolution against the system, Babylon, rebelling against because of roots. That's what we was doing. We were rebelling because of roots. We're not Kunta I mean, we're not Chicken George. We're all Kunta Kinte. We're going to bring down this thing. And I saw with my own eyes whilst doing that, that it moved away from the revolution. It moved away from... Um, from, from a struggle and it became money orientated oh, and it hasn't changed and it hasn't changed from since then times from them times I remember that I remember that change so strong I'm on yeah. the road at that time and I feel it and I see it so it's a desperate because I do not want to kill I do not want to hurt my own people mm. I come from a place where I live amongst a lot of racism we fought so it was illogical for me to, to have this you know animosity towards black people mm. I grew up in a racist um, place and also for a lot of us, the foundation was Rasta. Mm -hmm. Even though we didn't have the, the history to say we were this, we were that, mm -hmm. we had reggae songs mm -hmm. we could listen to, or sometimes you, you turn on TV and they had reggae sunsplash mm -hmm. or the odd interview with a Rasta fairy in like Muta Baruka or somebody. Mm -hmm. So, and they would give you glimpses and access to a history. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So what Marcus Garvey did for me, Marcus gave me, Marcus Garvey gave me an alternative that is what Marcus Garvey did for me. I didn't know of any other black man. Yeah, I knew of a black man. So what about man. the rasters around you? Because surely didn't they present? I tell you, I don't, I mean, if you wanted me to be honest and tell you how the road goes. T tell how, it, how talk it, goes, talk the things. When I'm younger. It's on a level talk show. It's on a level. Yeah, when man. I'm younger, um, most of the drugs, most of the guns, everything that's coming to me, is coming from people who are rasters. To me, who growed me. These are people who brought me up, giving me culture, telling me about Ethiopia, Elsa, El, 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 his imperial majesty and all the rest of it. Mm. When crack and cocaine come on this road, where do you think I was getting it from? Rasta man. Rasta man. My Backside. heart was crushed. Whoa. Yeah, yeah, you understand? Rough, rough, Thumping rough. and all them things. Massive in my day. Rough. Massive. Yeah. Yeah, 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 you understand? So um, the, the, the Rastas around me, yeah, we've got the odd few cultural rats, rats with people who held on who to the, the ground. Yeah, them. yeah, yeah. But the majority of them, what happened was because we had this idea that we're not working for the man, that left us only with the option of crime. Mm. You understand? In order to make money to in survive. In order to make money. So then this revolution became in, turned into a financial um, endeavor. But what was your parents at the time, and maybe grandparents or aunties or uncles? What was they saying to you? Like, well, well, you know, as I've said, I've been getting arrested from the nine years of age. There's nothing they can do to stop okay. me from doing what I'm doing. Yeah. Nothing. I'm 16 years of age. I'm on murder charge. You understand? 15 attempted murder. There's not. This is nine. There's nothing they can do to stop me. Mm. I don't go with my father, which is in my days. It's, it's that's not normal. In my day, I'm 50 years of age. In my day, there's very few people I know who hasn't go with their parents. The mm. phenomenon now that we see when there's a lot of one parent fa families. That wasn't in my day. Yeah, in my day, everybody had mommy and daddy in yeah, the yard. I never, I never, had, a, I never okay. had a father around me, you understand? So I never had mm. that discipline, mm. you understand? I never even had a granddad around me. So mm. I was brought up by my grandma and my mom, mm. you understand? So all they was interested in was my safety. So as long as I come out safe, that's all they was interested in. Mm. Yeah, 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 you understand? Um, so this is what I'm saying. So I never had that. So Marcus Garvey became the first black male role model in my life. Okay. And that is why I look to Marcus Garvey for an example of what a black man is and what a black man should be. So what did you then do? Did you then go and get books and started to read? Yeah. The first book I ever read on Marcus Garvey, I got it from the library. This is about, probably I would say about two months after the speech, after I got the speech, and it was the Black Moses. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It was written by a man called David Cronin. Yes, one of the I first think, yeah. Books, um, it's one of the first books published on Marcus Garvey mm. um, after Garvey had passed because, uh, as you know, if people don't know, after Marcus Garvey passed away, there's a massive blackout. You know, the only people who kind of keep Marcus Garvey's name in the public eye is the Rastas. Mm. Um, we, and we get to hear about it through music, Burning mm. Spear culture. So that's how, but other than that, mm. not many people was focusing, not many black people was focusing on literature and, you know, um, 
record in an archive in these things. These things come a lot later, as we know, people like Tony Martin, Rupert Lewis, these people go back and retrieve this information. That's how we get all these books yes. we have today. Yeah. But when I started, there was very few books on, on, on Marcus Garvey at the time, were definitely not accessible. And I only had the library at the time. Mm -hmm. So there was only one book in that library on Marcus Garvey, which was The Black Moses. Now remember, the title of that book is The Black Moses. So automatically, and the book is written in that, in that kind of, with that theme. Mm -hmm. The white person is saying, Marcus Garvey is the Black Moses. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I began to read Marcus Garvey and what he did through, through, that, mm -hmm. through that book. And the things that I learned was phenomenal. I was on. I was just. I was on road. What, what was I doing on road? I said that the thing had turned um, material and physical and economical, and it's all about finances. Yeah, and everybody's focused on that. Then I've just come out of that. Read about a man, and no, I don't know no black person who's made more money than this man. Mm. These are the things that like astounded me because money's still on my mind. I'm still young. I still want to make money. Mm. You understand? And when I read what Marcus Garvey did with the Black Star Line, because you know it's a very concise book, it tells you a lot of what he did ships, his boats, and all the rest of it. When just that one book, once I read that book and see what Marcus Garvey did, did, I had an idea then, you understand, of what he meant by we could obviously create a civilization in the future. Because what I saw him do, I still didn't know about the past at that time, but just mm. what I saw him do alone made me know that um, Garvey was an individual that I could look, look to to guide me to become the black man what I was looking to become because I understood that the black man that I'd become, even though I was very good at it, you understand? It wasn't the person I wanted to be. So I used it and I do training as you know. So what I used to say, there was a choice I had between being a professional black man or a black professional. You understand? That was a choice I had. What's the I'd difference? Know, well, the, when I was younger, the choice was a professional um, black man. To me, when I was younger, was like a coconut. Oh, uh, suit and tie. Suit and tie. <laughs> that was the only choice for me when I was younger. It's either suit a professional tie. black man um, or a black professional. So the black professional is a suit and tie. The professional black man is the man on road. Mm. You understand? That's the only options I had mm. when I was growing up. Marcus Garvey became the third option. Okay. And that is when I started to study about Marcus Garvey, who he is, what he says, and what his what he um what his philosophies were, what his ideas were, and what he achieved. And so and that you, started when I was about twenty years of age, twenty-one years of age. Wow. And you I mean, I know you ran courses from gangsterism to, to Gavi. Yeah. So you obviously went out into the community then mm -hmm. and started to teach your peers. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you shared some of what you knew with your brethren. What was the reaction like? Was it like nah nah nah? Or was they like, oh, okay, let's try and learn more about Gavis and let's try and do something can change our lifestyles around. What was the reaction? Um, to me personally, throughout my whole career, people are always susceptible about information about Marcus Garvey. People of any nationality, depends on how you present that information. If I'm talking to young people out there who's on road, obviously I'm going to deal with the economical aspects of Marcus Garvey. So when I started to tell him about the Negro Factories Corps, the Black Star Liner, the, you know, the, the, the different companies that he, that he runs, that's what interests them. You understand? If I, so anybody I talk to, because I now I've got that knowledge base of Marcus Garvey, I try to bring Marcus Garvey, make Marcus Garvey relevant to what their interests them are or what I think would interest them. So originally, what I was saying when I first, cause it took me about three, four years before I even went out there to speak about Marcus Garvey. People, mm -hmm. I had to come off road. People must understand that. Don't think that you just, I just picked up Marcus Garvey book. That's it, I'm off road. It doesn't go like that. Mm -hmm. It took me about three, four years, probably even five years to be clean. Clean of drugs, clean of gal, clean of everything. Mm -hmm. it took me a very, you know, going, I used to go out every single night. I'm a DJ, I'm out there all the time. How did the women react to you? Because I know you see what, like, you, had, you had a lot of women uh -huh. in, at, at that time of your life. How did they react to you once they began to see this change? Did they try to steer you towards the change or pull you away? Well, or becoming the man you wanted to be. What I knew I had to do, I knew I couldn't do it the way that I was doing. So I knew I had to have one woman. So yeah. I only had one, and I've only had one woman from that time. Yes, yeah, a beautiful wife. He's yeah. married so with his children. That beautiful time. wife. I came off the road that time. You understand? Yeah. And I got one woman, and that's the only one woman I've ever had from that time to now. From that time to she's okay. Me and everything. Yes, yeah. beautiful. So what, beautiful. What, so as I was saying, with me, what's happened now through the years, and as we'll see as we go through. 
Um, how I interpret Marcus Garvey and how I've taken on board Marcus Garvey, um, it, as I say, it, it's, a, it's a bit different from how most people perceive Marcus Garvey. So I've never had problems with relaying information about Marcus Garvey and inspiring people with information about Marcus Garvey. I've never had a problem with that. I've okay. always been susceptible to it. Anne Cobia, empowering the community with the On A Level talk show.